Okay, welcome everyone. I think we are now live and um, we are going to have an interesting session today um, on full stack development. With me, I've got Leif Ostrand, our VP of research, and my name is Nika Andersen. I'm a technical product marketing manager here at Vaadin. Um, basically, let's kick it off with um, a quick uh, housekeeping information. So uh, we are keeping all the lines muted while we do the webinar. Um, in case you have any questions, please feel free to, to uh, share your questions in the in the question panel. And in case we are not able to address your questions right away, uh, we will have a questions and answers um, section in the end of this this webinar. So you have a, a good possibility to ask any any questions you might have. And um, of course, we will send out the slides as well as the recording of this webinar to you uh, within roughly 24 hours. But um, without further ado, let's get started. Are we ready, Leif? Sure. All righty, awesome. So basically, we are going to talk about the, the um, full stack web development and I think it's it's very good to start with the with the basics and and the background. Um, how did we end up here? What what took us to the to the full stack development and what has the journey been so far? You Leif, have obviously been in the industry for quite a long time as a long time Vadiner. I I know that you have witnessed the evolution of of web frameworks very closely. So it's it's interesting to hear from you. Um, how do you see the the evolution of of web development? Yeah, I mean, I I started doing web way before I started at Vardin. So back in those days, I don't think even PHP existed. Uh, so back then, it was just static HTML, and then you had this thing called CGI bin if you wanted to do anything dynamic. But that was quite complicated, and you had to use Perl and and whatnot. So so that's that was interesting, uh, but then. Then kind of, I don't remember the date, but eventually we got this thing called, well, we got PHP, we got JSP, we got uh, ASP on the Microsoft stack and so on. And, and they all kind of the same concept that you you have this thing that dynamically generate your whole new HTML page for you. And then whenever the user clicks a button, it submits a form and then it generates a new, new page. And, and through that, you could build interactive web applications. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, at the same time, there were some some limitations with this because you actually reloaded the whole page whenever the user was doing any interaction. So, so it wasn't always optimal. Mm. So then people started uh, adding JavaScript to the mix because, I mean, Internet Explorer 4 had really great JavaScript support. Uh, so then eventually people learned kind of what, what's the good ways of doing things, what the bad, bad way of doing things. and and those best practices, they ended up in different kinds of, of JavaScript libraries. And out of those, jQuery is definitely the most, most widely used. Even today, I mean, there are those who say that even today, jQuery is more widely used than any kind of modern uh, web application development solution. So, so that's for, for kind of long-lived stuff. Uh, but anyways, the point here was that by using a little bit of JavaScript here and there, you could fetch new things from the server to react to that specific uh, interaction that the user did, but you didn't have to reload the whole entire page because, I mean, especially with uh, back in the days with not so fast network connections, that actually took a while. So, so instead you could optimize for the most important interactions by making them do this this thing called Ajax. So basically, just uh, asynchronously fetching fetching updates. Uh, but that, of course, wasn't enough. We developers we always want more and more and more. So we we started doing kind of what if the whole application is just one single page, and then I just use jQuery all the time to update everything. And it turned out that well, there are better ways of doing that. So that's why we kind of, again, learned what does work, what doesn't work. And then we ended up with uh, what's called kind of a single page application framework. So for instance, Angular kind of 
it's maybe not the first one but among the first ones and well it's opinionated whether that's the uh, the best one or not i just picked it because it kind of visually fit fitted well on this slide but you could put react or or lots of other solutions there also but the point really is that these frameworks they they kind of they have evolved with uh improved understanding of what are good way of doing a single page application mm -hmm. uh, I got a comment in the chat saying that you can't hear anything, but let's hope they still hear something. Um, mm, 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 mm. What more is it? Well, I mean, this is definitely lots of very great web apps have been built in this way, but at the same time, there are some problems. So um, maybe we should jump on to to the next slide and let's, see what let's let's see if, if we are having some audio challenges i'm i'm not actually sure at the moment um i think well, it's... there are other comments saying that it's good so okay probably, Great. Unfortunately, just Great. One who has some some problems <laughs> on their end <laughs> cool good. well in in that case i i think it would be interesting to to hear from you um what kind of challenges you typically see today with your web development workflows? Uh, what kind of challenges? Those might be like technical challenges or, or development workflow related challenges, or maybe they are related to user experience or, or accessibility, or depending on which industry or what kind of uh, industry you're working on, maybe security and compliance are, are the ones that, that are most, most relevant to you. So let's, let's hear it from you. Yeah, so and we're getting we... lots of votes in, but still trickle. Seems like technical complexity. So all the thing is kind of how do I make this thing work the way I want it to work is is a clear winner, at least so far. And then we got quite even between development workflows and well, it's a little bit gaining the lead there now between development workflow and security and compliance. But it seems like user experience as accessibility is, is not a well, I mean a little bit of a problem, but still not not as big of a concern as the other things. And actually now it's picking up also. This is really exciting. Well, One, more vote in it. <laughs> One more vote and it overtakes security and compliance. <laughs> ah, there we go. There we go. Very even. Yep. But anyways, it seems like all the complexities of of pure kind of technical aspects is is the biggest challenge for mm -hmm. for most people here. And no wonder. I mean, the tech stack can be quite bloated in in some cases. I've been part of the project where we had like tens of different tools that we had to use, and and yeah, countless number of of various libraries that we had to integrate with. So it can be super hard. Like the cognitive load of, of a developer can can become quite high. Yep. Yeah. Also, getting here a comment from from Sagar who says that that one challenge is definitely that there's kind of an information overload. There's so much yeah. to learn about all these different frameworks and solutions and and so on so so that's definitely yeah I, I would say that's also in the technical complexity category here yeah absolutely i mean it, it goes to to the fact that you need to learn what you're using and and just knowing superficially some some things might might bite you in the end yeah but at the same time the best way of learning is by doing mistakes <laughs> Just I prefer to, to learn it. from other people's mistakes. <laughs> People say you should do that, but I, I've never figured out how to do it. Yeah. The, the trick is just to make those mistakes at a small scale. True. All Seems right. Like we're not, yeah, not getting any more votes, so let's... Yep. Looking good, looking here. good. So no, no wonder technical complexity is, is topping up and... Um, Security and compliance is, is on the second place. 
And on the shared third place, we've got the development workflow as well as the user experience and accessibility. Cool, cool. All right, well, let's move on. Thanks for, for your vote, really appreciate that. So now that we, we heard about the, the possible challenges that, that one might have experienced, um, could you elaborate a bit Leif, on, on the, some, some of the challenges that we typically see with single page applications. Mm, yeah, I mean, we, we see it here on the screen already. The, the kind of the general structure is you got, uh, here I'm taking React as an example, you got a front end application built using mostly React and then a little bit of your own logic kind of on the right side of the stack, so to say. Uh, and then on the server, you get for instance, I'm a Java developer, so I, I, I think Spring Boot is a good option for, uh, for the server side of the application, for the business logic and, and kind of talking with persistence or, or other third party integrations like sending emails or, or whatever. Mm. And then in between, to kind of connect these two separate parts together, we got a REST API. It could be GraphQL, it could be, it could be something else, but REST is the most, most common solution there. And at, at least in my or from my point of view, the very big challenge with this kind of setup is that you're building two different applications. It's it's kind of one of the things I learned in university was that uh, one of the biggest things you can build is a distributed system because there's so many things that can, can go wrong. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So, I mean, no wonder that people are struggling with, with the technical complexity and, and making it secure and, and, and all, all those kinds of things. And that's also, I mean, that's what many others have been observing also, uh, which is why there's this thing that, that we're actually talking about here, which is full stack development. So the idea there really is that what if we would have just one application mm. and of course there needs to be communication because some things need to run in the browser some things need to run on the server but still what if we treat that as one unified single application instead of having two independent applications that that talk with each other mm. so that's where we come to for instance uh, i think one of the maybe easiest to understand approaches is uh, in the next.js framework uh, what they have is almost exactly the same picture, except instead of using, uh, I mean, Next.js, that's JavaScript throughout. So you also run, run JavaScript on the server there, uh, which also simplifies things a little bit. Uh, but there they use something called React Server Components, which means that you can kind of, you write your UI logic with React, but you don't need to care does this, thing run in the server or in the browser, because that's something that the React server components take care of for you. So by default, things are kind of server-side rendered. If you use some, some spe special features that only work in the browser, then quite automatically, those are then only run there. And then, then the next JS framework kind of keeps all of those things in sync. Mm. At the same time, the business logic is the same, persistence is the same as though you would have two separate applications. But the really main thing here is that you have one single application. Mm. And, and when we talk about like one single application, how, how would you say, does it also reflect on the, on the code base? Like, is it just one coherent application in, in the one repository? That is, how, how does it work typically? Yeah, uh, that's just exactly how it works. And uh, we'll, we'll actually get to that slightly later, but okay. but one one key thing here is that thanks to Next.js also running JS on the server, it means that they actually can use the same language throughout mm -hmm. the whole application, uh, which also means that you can share data types and so on. At the same time, people are also concerned that doesn't this lead to kind of mixing things up? And I mean, uh, <laughs> there was actually a bit of controversy, uh, was it last year? when this React server components kind of architecture was announced, because in the example, they had a React component with a click listener, which inline in that click listener function 
it was actually running SQL. And <laughs> that's maybe not the best practice, but it's very, very powerful for just showing how kind of the concept. Mm -hmm. But of course, you need to still have, have your own abstractions and structure your code in a sensible way and so on. But the point is still that you can do it that way. And that really shows the power of, of combining everything. Cool. Sounds, sounds really good. Uh, so, so it's, it's basically, you, you were referring to, to like, or I was hearing that you were referring to the uh, single responsibility principle. So, so that there should be like only, only sing, single responsibility for, for application or, or part of the application. How, how do those concerns are separated in, in this kind of approach? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can kind of do it. If you think of the previous architecture that we saw with the mm -hmm. kind of front end application, the back end application, and then you had rest as the kind of interface between them. Uh, when you have that ab uh, abstraction, then you are kind of, you don't have a choice. You have to define the interface, the rest part there that goes in the middle and that separates those two kind of different concerns from each other. And in that way, you have fewer chances of creating a complete mess out of your code. When you're using a full stack architecture, like for instance, Next.js, uh, what you instead can still do because I mean you're using a, a programming language. You can split things up into multiple mm -hmm. files. You can uh, put those files in separate directories. You can even use uh, okay. Well, actually, JavaScript doesn't have much of that, but you can use language features to say that kind of these are the public APIs of this module or something. Actually, you can do do that in JavaScript also. So you you can you still have the possibility of creating a structure that makes sense for you, which might not always be that you draw a very hard line mm. between the server and the client, because sometimes it makes more sense to draw the line in, in some other places. Yeah. So so to to be aligned with with that ideology, you you wouldn't have to have like two separate applications instead one application and, and different compartments within that application. And and that's basically how you separate the concerns and, and focus on one thing in, in one compartment. Yeah. Cool. It's actually exactly like uh, Gerhard wrote in a comment here, or a question, there's actually a comment here, which is, it reminds me of the Delphi days with power comes responsibility. And that's quite true. You could create quite a mess with with that with Delphi also exactly because it was so easy to just put everything in your click listener. I can imagine, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but if we continue, yeah, uh, we still have kind of a problem that I referred to. I'm a Java guy. My employer might have lots of existing backend logic implemented in java i've got lots of java systems to integrate with all the developers in my team they know java and so on so uh, we might need other kind of full stack architecture examples also uh, and that brings us to the hila framework that we at vaad in our building so this is an example of a different thing it's still very much a full stack application because it's just one single application that you treat as as a whole, it's everything goes into the same code repository and so on. Uh, but uh, here we got again Spring Boot running on on the server. That's Java, but then in the browser running uh, React and using uh, reusable web components for like buttons and grids and so on. And then to glue those together, what you can do is that you can you can take your Java kind of. Mm, it's tempting to call them endpoints, but that makes people think of rest. And then you kind of start thinking in, in the wrong direction. So it's more kind of RPC endpoints, not rest endpoints, but still you have your Java, Java classes defining. These are the things that I want to make available for, for the UI logic. And then based on that, the Hilla framework actually this generates TypeScript code for calling those directly. 
which means that yes you got two different languages there's a little bit of um, of kind of different convention like how nullability is handled and and javascript got, got both null and undefined as as types whereas mm -hmm. uh, java only has null and so on so a little bit of conversion and mixing and matching is needed but still it's very much so that you can you can still treat it as one single application thanks to automatically generating uh, uh, those uh, kind of rpc endpoints there's also a slightly kind of weaker approach of this uh, architecture, uh, which usually goes by the name of API first development. So there you use something like uh, uh, open API. So swagger basically, where you start by defining these are the, these are the things I want to send over the network. And then based on that, you can generate both a Java stub for the server and for instance, TypeScript uh, client for calling those and it kind of goes the same way but the mindset there is quite often that then you have actually you got those two separate applications technically you could mix them but that's not the general convention so i would call that kind of halfway to full stack but not really there that kind of reminds me of like back in the days when we used to have things such as corba and then later down the road we had soap which which are basically providing similar kinds of things rpc right yep cool. yeah i mean i would say the big difference compared to those technologies that i know is see kind of <laughs> ancient is that this is a really lightweight structure uh -huh. because that this type safe rpc it's basically it's just a method call and it's just json going going uh, over http whereas with well actually i don't even remember what corba had what so soap at least was a huge pile of xml and and quite challenging to to actually make any sense of so it's i mean that's the other thing with with all of software development it always goes kind of back and forth between extremes we got kind of soap, which was very extreme in one direction. And then people said that, no, this is way too complicated. Let's do just simple HTTP. And then we got rest and that, that gradually kind of got more and more extreme. And then it just swings back and forth. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Seen, seen, it, seen the pendulum going multiple times from yep. the one end to the other. <laughs> yep. Another thing is kind of rich client versus thin client thin and so client, on. Yep. Cool. Well. What if I'm a Java developer and I don't know JavaScript too well? Hilla might not be my, my cup of tea. What else do we have? Yes. Well, there's a kind of, I mean, in one way, about in flow is it's exactly the same idea as Next.js. It's mm -hmm. only the language that is different. So in that way, it's, I mean, okay, we, we also were, 10, 15 years before Next.js, <laughs> but but the concept is is very very similar. You got you write your UI logic in Java. You have direct access to all your business logic. Of course, there comes again the responsibility. You still want to somehow split things up to not create a mess of your code, mm -hmm. but you still have the power to to have direct uh, access between those two layers, mm -hmm. and and then. I mean, in the case of Next.js, it's the, the, the React server components uh, architecture that synchronizes things between the server and the client. And in the case of Flow, it's instead Flow's rendering engine that automatically takes the component tree that you build through server-side Java and use kind of remote control the corresponding web components in the browser. And in that way, you again, you only need to be concerned about the the server side Java part and everything else is handled by the framework. Cool. So, so contrasting the two, the the Vadim flow and, and Hilla, do, does it mean that basically the, the components and the business logic they they are pretty much the same, whereas what happens in between differs a bit. We in in Hilla we have the React and in in Vadin it's all the way Java. Yep. Mm. 
I think you said it already. I mean, it's it's mostly it's it, it's a matter of preference. Do you? Because uh, in one way, either flow or Next.js, that's really the optimal thing because then you got it's very very unified. Yeah. But there is this trade off that if you want to say build offline functionality, then you need to have a little bit of separation. And that's where Hila's approach with the with the kind of explicitly defined uh, RPC browser callable service endpoints helps you kind of control when those network requests actually happen. Uh, the same also goes with uh, if if you want to use some uh, browser APIs that maybe aren't supported by Flow or also some browser APIs that, or not browser APIs, but if you've got a use case where it's very important to have low latency, you mm. need to be able to react to clicks immediately, not wait 100 milliseconds for a server round trap, but, but actually immediately do some updates, like dragging and dropping to, to draw something like Figma is a good example of that. Then also you, you might want to have more, more of that logic actually running in the client, but you can still benefit from from the full stack thinking through through the other parts of the application. That sounds really good. So um, now now that we we've been contrasting Hill and and um, Flow, uh, let's let's do similar kind of contrasting between all all the different approaches that we we just went through, shall we? Yeah, I mean we we kind of here very visually see. What I already said that Next.js and Flow they are very very similar because you have this kind of full stack UI logic or server side UI logic that is kind of hiding the communication completely. You don't need to think about that basically at all. Uh, at the same time, you might also want to have a little bit more control over the communication over things. So there you got Hilla, which is again very very similar to the. Uh, SPA architecture with two independent apps, but still merging those two apps together and making one unified application that that makes you you can almost forget the network with Hilla. Also, you, you're kind of aware of it because you you need to put some annotations on the classes, and mm -hmm. you actually it's it's kind of TypeScript calling into Java, so you 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 use different different syntax for the arrow functions, but otherwise it's it's almost completely transparent. And I think that's a quite good trade-off. So you don't completely forget it, but it's still still almost invisible. Um, from, from the university times, I, I do remember the Conway's law saying that roughly, roughly around uh, that your software structure resembles your organizational structure, something along the lines. Now, if we already make the decision that, okay, let's let's do a uh, single page application uh, with a generic backend application, and I end up having two different applications, the front end and the back end. Um, it's, it's kind of pushing me uh, into two separate teams perhaps, or, or at least it, it yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think out loud that how how to approach this is it is it kind of like a chicken or egg problem that which which one comes first the the software architecture and and then team structure or the other way around yep mm. i mean we that, that that's basically where we're heading now so i mean in this presentation uh, because the next thing really to think about is what are the benefits and also the trade-offs of having a full stack application and at least in my experience, it's very much indeed about how is your team's team structured because that, uh, I mean, that's more of a management question than a kind of pure technical question, but it's also, that's, that's where the really powerful, powerful differences come in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's actually a good segue to our, our uh, next poll. So uh, it would be awesome to hear from you, audience, how do you work today? Uh, what kind of a uh, team structure do you have in the place? So let's let's hear it from you.
yeah so starting to get results in and maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you put full stack in the title of the webinar then you attract full stack development teams but i'm also seeing a fair share of of of, of, of people who say that they have dedicated front-end and back-end teams so maybe they're curious about what what the benefits might be maybe it's not their choice I difficult to speculate and then also don't have a formal team structure which I mean kind of probably still there's some logic to who touches what part of the application or maybe it's well it's it's hard to say uh, but those are still minority compared to the other groups. Yes, seems like we settled down on 58% yep. full stack teams. That's cool. That's that's more than I was anticipating. But as you said, if uh, we we have very uh, special audience, many are are probably very geared towards full stack development already. So that's that's cool stuff. All right. Well, with the poll uh, of the way, let's let's move on with the webinar. Um, could you elaborate a bit on on the benefits of, of full stack development? Why why do we do that? What what's so great about full stack? Yeah, mm, I mean, we have already been quite much looking at the kind of looking at that on the surface. Like one thing is definitely that you you completely avoid a bunch of waste so to say uh, so you don't have to spend time defining your uh ui logic or not ui logic your end rest endpoints you don't have to spend time i mean maybe it's a little bit of a kind of caricature uh exaggerating but but i've heard many comments about api and design committees that are just there to kind of make the front end teams and the back end teams agree with each other on what the API should actually look like. And that's something that, I mean, you, you can't completely forget that even with a full stack architecture, because you still need to be mindful of not sending too much data over the network and security issues and so on. But you can very much reduce the the kind of the waste that that you can say happens there. Another thing also is, keeping things in sync. So uh, mm -hmm. with Hilla, for instance, when you make a change on the Java side to any type that, that is used in, in, in those uh, RPCs, then you will automatically through TypeScript find all the places in client side code that need to change now, which again, it, it really kind of, it helps you avoid spending time, wasting time on, on doing those things. So that's, I would say that that's maybe the most kind of tangible benefit that you get but at the same time it's it's maybe not even the most powerful one so uh other things uh that you also kind of get as a benefit is is true that you just you have fewer bugs hmm. because there's fewer moving pieces you have those things that are always in sync with each other and so on so so that's that's again i would say that that's still also a technical benefit uh, but the real real power uh, i would say comes from when we get to the more management point of view when team structures and so on because when you have a a full stack application <clears throat> what it means is that you have structured your development so that a single developer can in a single commit add a new end to end feature to your application without that you Typically, uh, again, there might be exceptions, but quite typical is that, well, maybe the front end team starts with a UI design and does a rough implementation. And then they conclude that, well, we need these and these and these things from the server. Uh, and then they write a ticket for the backend team. And then it, the backend team has some other things going on right then. And then a couple of days later, the backend team actually gets that ticket to the top of their backlog they start working on it. It takes a couple of days days for them to, to kind of iterate on it. Then they say that, okay, now we've closed this ticket. You need to wait for a new version to be deployed and so on. 
and then the front-end team can continue uh, uh, once again kind of then they add it to, to their backlog that okay now, now we can continue but they have some other things in progress at the same time which means that yes you, you waste a little bit of kind of active working time but even more you kind of it's the calendar time that counts yeah. instead of just in a single single day or a couple of days building one feature end to end just because of the coordination and backlog conflicts and so on you end up with often kind of it can take several weeks to get even i mean yes i'm exaggerating a little bit but i i have definitely i i have talked with with kind of customers of ours who said that that was the breaking point for them they they tried building quite complex application with with uh i think it was angular and technically things were working but it was really very really frustrating for kind of for product managers that it took such a long time from when development started with a feature until it was actually completed because of these handovers between the different teams so so that's that's i would say maybe one of the most uh impactful uh benefits of of a front uh, full stack development approach uh related to this also is when you have everything one code base i mean not not necessarily even a single developer you might still have kind of i got one react expert and one java expert in my team and they might work together on it and maybe a little bit of handovers within the same team but that's still much quicker iteration than if you need to go to a different team that to probably has slightly different priorities and so on and then the other thing i said is everything can be a single commit or a single pull request maybe there's many commits there in that pull request but anyways you get everything reviewed and merged at once and what that gives really is uh, agility uh, maybe not the kind of dogs running around agility but uh kind of as a business for, for, from a, again more product management point of view what you get there is that you can much more quickly react when you realize that oh we need to do this you get better um better kind of collaboration or you can build things in a more iterative way you kind of you can get the first version end-to-end -end working in the hand of testers or pilot customers or something very very quickly and then you can iterate based on that in a much better way than if it takes uh, several days to get any changes through through the whole stack so so that's probably the much more kind of profound benefits of of this kind of approach uh, they are not as obvious when you just with a kind of developer mindset look at it but if if you look at it more from a kind of management perspective and if you uh, if you kind of actually have experienced that pain then it's it's a very very important difference yeah i i can easily relate to that and 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 also to add to that i i would say it's it's not only for the product managers or or management in general who who is very happy about this this development i would say from the developer perspective it's also really satisfying to see how how your features are actually getting into the product and when you are very closely involved in the feature development end to end you feel stronger ownership of for those features and seeing those go live is it's just very satisfying feeling yeah. and i i feel just my personal opinion that if if you're a developer and and doing a full stack development having a team around you who is capable of delivering end to end features i i think that's pretty awesome much much more fun than than throwing your your back end stuff to to the other side of the fence and and hoping that someone will will pick it up and and do the magic there yeah cool yeah. Awesome. one thing also that comes to mind is um, there's been plenty of examples from companies like uh, spotify and github for instance where they have explicitly as a goal that a newly recruited developer should be able to deploy a meaningful change to production during their first working day and that's again something that really drives you towards this kind of full stack approach where where you don't have a distributed system 
Well, I, I sure hope they have really good deployment pipelines in place just to make it a bit easier. <laughs> they have learned after a couple of first junior developers who started. <laughs> Those poor developers. <laughs> cool. Well, it, it, it sounds really good. Really, really good. But uh, is, it, is it perfect? Well, no, there's no silver bullet that we all know. So uh, there's definitely uh, several things to to kind of keep in mind. Uh, the first thing is that do you actually even need a full stack, no, not full stack, single page application uh, because it's even simpler, no, no, no matter how you slice it, it's even simpler if you actually build a multi-page application. You can do it as in the good old PHP days and uh, the user experience might not be as fancy but there are also lots of applications where that's still very much good enough. So, so again, this is a way of building, I mean, full stack applications. That's a way of building more sophisticated user experiences. Whereas uh, if, if you don't need that, then there are even simpler, easier approaches that, that you might also want to consider. Uh, other things is, let's see, which order did we have? Oh yeah, third-party clients. So if you, I mean, this isn't truly really a trade-off, but it many see it as a trade-off because they say that, well, yeah, I would love to build things in this way, but we also have this third-party client that needs a REST API anyways. So then it would feel kind of like wasteful to not also use that same REST API for the main web UI that we're building. and I think that's nonsense because, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of a hot take, I know. Uh, there is this, uh, it's not invented by me in any ways, there is this thing called backend for frontends, uh, which is the thinking that you will anyways need to have, you have different data access patterns, you have different kind of, you got the mobile UI with just shows one or two columns in a data grid and the web UI that shows 15 columns and you need to have anyways kind of different ways of accessing data and at the end of the day the the meat of the application that's the UI logic and the business logic whereas the glue in between those if you measure just kind of how many lines of code that is it's a relatively small part of the whole application which means that you actually probably end up quicker if you implement separate glues for different clients instead of trying to force everything to be just a single REST API. Makes sense. Yep. What else do we have? We got uh, offline oh, yeah. is one potential concern because, I mean, like we talked about, if you're using uh, Flow or Next.js, that kind of Full, full stack application architecture, then you a little bit, you're quite tied to actually having that server accessible all the time. And that definitely helps simplify things. But if you need good offline support, then you might want to keep them a little bit apart from each other. So then th that, that's when we're talking about HILA or different mm -hmm. kinds of API first approaches. Uh, next, uh, performance so here we again have the same thing that yes you do give up a little bit of control when you get this full stack solution you cannot or you're encouraged to not fine tune exactly the message format going over the network and so on so that's that's what you give up in order to get the productivity benefits uh, you might still again want to tune back on that and again for instance api first might be a good solution if it's very important to squeeze the last bit out of the network connection or things like that. But also quite often we're talking about kind of business application used in an office building where the server is in the basement and then it doesn't matter almost at all if you're sending 10 bytes or 10 megabytes over the net network. Okay, I'm exaggerating again, but, but the point is that if you just focus on performance, then you probably miss some points unless it's very essential for you. Makes sense. Uh, finally, we got this separation of concerns that you also mentioned. I kind of touched upon it also. 
the point here is that yes if you got two separate applications then you're absolutely necessarily forced to have a separation but even if you technically have the capability of mixing thing things it doesn't mean that you should do that all the time so again you can use for instance in java you can do a multi-module application it's still one single application in one uh, uh one git repository mm -hmm. but you still build it as separate modules so that one module depends on the other which means that you can't you you can't kind of have dependencies going the wrong way uh, also even even simpler maybe uh is to use uh there's these testing solutions for instance arc unit is one quite popular one where you can for your code structure you can define rules and then when you run your regular uh, ui tests uh, ui test unit tests i mean it can also verify that you are not breaking those those kind of separation of concern boundaries so you can still you can still avoid causing a mess for yourself even if you don't have that very 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 hard boundary in the middle of course there is this like commented there's this uh, responsibility it's up to you to do it uh, and i think yes you should do it but you will still get lots of benefits from kind of being able to do everything as a single commit even though it's a commit that touches several modules or, and so on but i guess from the version control viewpoint there are multiple options how how to op approach the same i mean you can you can do a pull request with multiple commits and, and touching a bit broader yeah. area or you can just create a separate feature branch or yeah uh, and then we actually we also got a completely different dimension uh, that I forgot to mention is team size. So, I mean, it's universally accepted that probably you, I mean, it depends on who you ask, but between four and eight team members is where most people draw the limit that kind of any more than that. And you get uh, communication overhead within the team that makes it more sensible to split it up. But when you split, if you split up your team structure so that, well, I got a front end team and I got a back end team, then you can have two teams. But what happens if you need to scale further than that? So instead, what if you split the kind of split the application based on the business domain? So a very typical example is kind of some kind of web shop. You can have the shopping cart experience is owned by one team and then the kind of browsing products and search and so on might be a second team and with that setup each team can can kind of work independently build things in a single commit and so on you might want to have those in separate git repositories but as long as you just have one or three or four teams it probably makes sense to treat it as one you kind of build it as one big application you deploy it as one big application if you go even bigger than that, then you might want to look into micro front ends and so on also, but still slicing by business domains instead of by technical domains, that's still a, a good practice, I would say. Yeah, cool. Well, that's that's lots of stuff. Um, so we've basically gone through the, the evolution of uh, web development from the very early days you all mentioned things like Perl. I, I remember doing Perl and CGI scripts back in the 90s. I'm old as dust. So, <laughs> so yeah, there you go. And uh, through the single page applications to the, uh, to the challenges with them. And now we've heard about the, the benefits and also the trades of, uh, of full stack development. So really good stuff. Um, I think this, is, uh, this, this has been very helpful for me. Uh, something I, I didn't mention in the beginning of the webinar, I'm, I'm a very greenhorn Vardiner. I just joined the company uh, a month ago or a bit over a month ago, and uh, I'm also learning about uh, many of the things that we are talking about, and this has been super helpful for me. And um, I also hope that this has been very helpful for our audience. And um, with that, I think it's time to go into the questions and feedback. Um, I can see we've got quite a few questions here in the chat. Yeah, um, I just scrolled through the questions. I didn't get to the end, but there's very many good questions here. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, we got, well, actually, yeah, we got, I think I covered this. We got from Mahmoud asking about kind of how do we still have that 
separation and visibility on different parts and so on. And I think there the solution is that you can and should probably still define explicit interfaces for those, but those can use the regular language, programming language constructs that you have instead of being completely separate applications. Uh, we got Arthur asking uh, how to solve UX, UX design, I think, that's the same problem regardless of whether it's full stack application or a single page application or anything like that so so i think we have a different webinar for that maybe why not uh, then we got oliver asking uh yeah this is a this is a good one uh what's what's the difference between a full stack application and the monolithic application that that everyone was very eager to replace with microservices a while ago um, and i think if you look at microservices uh, five years ago everyone was really eager about hey yes everything should be a microservice and and that was really kind of the most most hot buzzword at those times but in this couple of last years Maybe two years ago, it started to be kind of lots of blog posts and and opinions saying that hmm, maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all, because we realized we we're building a distributed system and it's quite difficult to build distributed systems. So actually, I think the last couple of years, there's been again this pendulum going back and forth and we are quite much going back to towards people realizing that, hmm, yeah, maybe we should have monoliths after all. But maybe, I think the latest kind of trend, you could call it, is this thing called modular monolith. So for instance, uh, well, the arc unit tool that I mentioned, that's one way of actually having a mod modular monolith. In in the spring world, there there, there is this uh, library or kind of part of Spring nowadays called, uh, no, I lost the name, Spring uh, Modulate is the name of it, I think. So that's also a way of helping you keep a modular structure, but still having a mon monolithic application as the kind of, as the single thing that you're building. So I think I think that's, that's how I view, view that kind of difference between old, monoliths and new monoliths. Mm. Next comment, uh, Mahmoud actually, he was the one who commented about separation of concerns. He also continues with that. So I think we covered that. Uh, Amir is asking, why is full stack not popular now? and what has changed for it to kind of become popular. I think this is, it's a rising trend, definitely, because in many ways, the really mainstream way of developing applications has been React and whatever on the back end. Maybe it's Spring Boot, maybe it's it's kind of uh, some Node.js solution, maybe it's some .NET solution, but more and more, if you follow kind of React developers, lots of them nowadays are starting to see that, hmm, this next JS thing, which is relatively new, it's really cool because now I can do everything on my own. And uh, for instance, there's this uh, quite influential YouTuber called Tio who has done lots of videos on that topic and, and lots of people seem to agree with, I mean, he's quite controversial in many ways, but lots of people definitely seem to agree with the basic notion that that this is a new way of doing things because why hasn't this happened earlier because just getting the basic single page application thing to the point where it's really useful that took a couple of years of just iteration and evolution and now we are kind of ready for the next step but at the same time there's solutions like void and there's also in the java space we get we got set k and a whole bunch of old farts who have done this all, all the time and maybe not been really mainstream but still kind of shown that this is a viable way and I think all those solutions will, will now gradually also become more popular when 
when the kind of pendulum starts to swing away from SBAs towards uh, more of a full stack approach. Cool, uh, that was well put. We're kind of running out of time here and we, we got are. any questions. Should we just go through them or did you see if there's any particularly tricky question to, to attack? Well, not necessarily tricky for you. Uh, something that I'm I'm also interested to hear. Can you can you use Tailwind along with Flow? Can you use Tailwind along with Flow? So that's got kind of nothing to do with full stack development, but yes, you can. I mean, Tailwind is just some CSS that you load on the page. Correct. Uh, what gets a little bit tricky is to mix Tailwind with the built-in Flow component. So, I mean, you don't want to use flows vertical layout layout horizontal layout components but yeah. instead use put a div there and put the tailwind css class names on those and then you can still put vadim buttons and grids and so on inside that tailwind structure so yes that's something you can definitely do i think we got some example out there but i don't remember the link right now yeah so so there are multiple ways to to style vadim out of the box components based on your liking and, and requirements yeah i mean you can even do also take tailwind buttons and all those things and create java apis for them but that's slightly more effort yeah cool all righty well we are almost at the top of the hour um i don't think we have a possibility to go through every single question but as i i promised to you we'll get back to you with the answers to your questions for which we were not able to provide an answer during this session. Um, we will also send out the presentation as well as the recording to you. So uh, you have an opportunity to go through it one more time. And uh, before we actually leave, I wanted to use this opportunity to remind everyone what that we have a really, really awesome uh, conference approaching in lovely Germany in the end of October. And as a thank you for all of the webinar participants, we are uh, providing you a promo code webinar, which gives you uh, 200 euros off uh, of the ticket. Um, yeah, I, I will be there. I'm pretty sure Leif will be there yes. and many other Vardiners will be there as well. So really, really looking forward to seeing you all in, in Germany, Frankfurt in the end of the October. Since we still got one and a half minutes left, well, <laughs> I want to squeeze in also an advertisement. We released uh, Vardin 24.5 beta just today. The release notes are not yet out, but you can find it in, in the Vardin pre-release repository. So please try it out. The new big features are Copilot flow support. We got this new thing called Control Center that lets you uh, mix uh, or kind of manage your Kubernetes deployed Vardin application. We got improvements to mixing React and Flow or Hill and Flow components in different ways and a whole bunch of UI component improvements also. So try that out. And I think we will have a webinar soon-ish also going through Absolutely. all those features in more than one minute. Sounds really great and, and super excited. And, and I, I'm really happy about us making the, the better release today so that we got the opportunity to announce it in this webinar. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your participation. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Leif. It was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, yeah, have a great day. And um, we'll be sending you the information I, I promised. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye.